Well, good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to this uh, leadership forum today. And it's especially a pleasure because this leadership forum has a special twist to it. Our guest today is Kurt Larson, uh, who we are recognizing today as our distinguished executive alumnus of the year. Before I tell you uh, much about Kurt, I want to acknowledge uh, members of his family who are here with us, his wife, Dawn, who's right over here his son Jordan and Brandon, and his colleague and uh, uh, partner in the business with Don and uh, himself is COO at the company he uh, and Don co-founded and run Resource Management Inc., Mark Schulberg. So if you'll join me, let's welcome our guest today. <laughs> Kurt is uh, a true Aggie uh, born in and bred here in Logan, Utah, uh, who graduated from Utah State in 1969 from the College of Business uh, with a degree in uh, personnel industrial management. Uh, he has been a member of our National Advisory Board for at least 15 years. How many years in total? You know, it's, uh, it, I think it's been at least 12 to 15. So yeah, some, something like that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, because that's a board that I spend a fair amount of time with each year, I can tell you from firsthand uh, knowledge that Kurt has been a tremendous supporter of this school. So much of the progress that you see or have seen uh, in the last uh, dozen years or so, Kurt has had a hand in that. Uh, and I'm deeply grateful for, for that. Uh, he's a passionate Aggie. Uh, I've, I mentioned just before we came in today to Kurt and his family that I knew that one day he would be a dis the distinguished executive alumnus when we spent some time together at an Aggie football game, uh, and that came out. But let me tell you just a little bit about Kurt before we get uh, too far into it. Uh, after he, uh, he graduated in 1969, he joined the Army. He had been with the ROTC here on campus, and as you know, that was uh, right in the middle of the Vietnam War. Uh, and he did spend time over in Vietnam. And uh, maybe he'll talk a little bit more about some of his experiences there and elsewhere. Uh, but he was in the Army for about 10 years. His last assignment was teaching military history and leadership uh, as part of the ROTC program down at BYU. Uh, he then went into a variety of different uh, businesses uh, and again, I'm going to ask him to share a little bit about that history, some in real estate and some other places, before he and Don co-founded Resource Management, Inc. Uh, in what year was that? Uh, 1992. 1992. Uh, September of 1992. 1992. 28 years. That company has been an, uh, actually an amazing success. Uh, today, the revenues are someplace in the 650 to $700 million range annually. They serve uh, something like uh, uh, 14,000 employees in 350 plus different companies around the country. Uh, and we're going to ask him a little bit to tell us a little bit about what the business is. But uh, it's basically, as I understand it, a, sort of a resource outsourcing business. Is that right for human resources? All of the things that uh, people are not very um, educated to do when they start a business, we handle everything that is is really kind of the toughest things. Um, Tell payroll, us a little bit more about tax it. filings. Yeah, tax filing. Uh, all of the uh, human resource side of things, from hiring to um, disciplinary actions to making sure that things are done and done properly, uh, training. Uh, sexual harassment, all of the different kinds of things that uh, that we deal with in, in today's business. And uh, and then we provide benefits across the board to all of our uh, uh, co-employees, what we call them in our client companies, so that they have the economies of scale of hundreds of companies put together and they get better health insurance, better ben benefits, better cost, they end up with 401k, they end up with uh, educational assistance programs, we have uh, investment assistance programs, again, that a small business generally would not have. 
And uh, our target market is five uh, employees up to a uh, thousand. So it's, it's basically small business all over. And we operate in all 50 states uh, with offices in uh, our, our corporate offices here in Salt Lake City or is in Salt Lake City. Uh, offices in, uh, in Seattle, Portland, uh, Denver, St. George, and uh, that's all for right now. But we, we have lots of employees in Alaska, we, just anywhere you want to name, uh, we have companies. Um, we have uh, three kind of target markets. One, we have about a third of our business in medical and medically related, so that our physicians and physician groups can uh, stay focused on their core competency. And then uh, uh, property management, large property management firms all over the country. And then kind of a Heinz 57 of uh, white collar, engineering, uh, architects, uh, machinists, uh, higher end uh, in the uh, construction industry like electricians, et cetera. So it's, it's an amazing business and uh, it's a great business model. Kurt, tell us why 1992 was a particularly good time for you to start this business. Uh, Don and I had actually been um, working for a, another company that I had helped the uh, folks acquire, and it was a what's called a professional employee organization, is, and that's what we are. Uh, and uh, we had been there for four years, basically had pulled it out of bankruptcy because it had not been run properly. We're a large fiduciary. So out of that six, $700 million, uh, the majority of that belongs to the federal government, to the employees, and to uh, all of the other um, uh, benefits that we have to pay for. It would include withholding for social withholding, security and yeah. uh, 401ks. We pay and millions a month to the feds. Yeah. So, um, Anyway, that's, uh, that, that's kind of what we do. We got involved uh, in our business because uh, uh, this, this, I, it was a partner in that business, but I was a minority uh, shareholder. And the fellow who owned the business decided to bring his children in and they didn't have to work. They just came in to get their paycheck. And growing up here in Logan, uh, I mean, I grew up picking beans out to Del Monte. Smithville. Yeah. And uh, two and a half cents a pound. That's exactly right. And uh, I, it, that didn't go over well. And, and Dawn had worked hard all of her life. So the idea of giving people money for not working didn't, didn't sit well. So we did not have a non-compete. We decided, okay, we'd had enough and we were going to go start our own thing. And that's when we started resource management. And uh, we started it with uh, Dawn and I and uh, two other people. And uh, one of them has since retired and, uh, it, you know, great guy, he's a marketing guy. And uh, he retired about 10 years ago with, uh, at that time it was quite a bit, a million, I think it was a million one. And uh, then we haven't looked back since. Yeah. And our people, Mark has been with us 20 years. Uh, many of our folks uh, came right out of college and uh, they, many of them have been with us 15 to 20, 24 years, uh, which has been really nice, but that's how what, we got it. What, uh, what accounts for the tremendous growth in your business? Uh, I, I think it has a lot to do with the model itself. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that we have a lot here in Utah, we have a lot of entrepreneurial people. Yeah. And just because you know how to make a widget doesn't mean that you're very adept at paying taxes, uh, dealing with all of the uh, Department of Labor requirements, uh, uh, being able to uh, shop for health insurance, which is very expensive. Uh, I don't need to tell you all that. It's, uh, it's just out of this world. And so uh, I think that's been one of the big things is that people uh, have said, okay, we want to focus on our core competency our core business, we know what we're good at. And to outsource what we do uh, makes a lot of sense. And we're a very high touch business. Uh, they don't just come to us and get online and get their stuff. Although we have a full human resource information system, um, they very often need to talk to a human being. So if you call into resource management, you're gonna always talk to somebody. Yeah, I uh, don't want to have anything other than that. 
Uh, and so uh, essentially we try to help them build their corporate culture. Uh, we stand in the background. We want their company to get the kudos for having a very robust 401k, a 125 cafeteria plan or flexible spending account to investment assistance programs, things that generally only the largest companies in the state of Utah could provide. And we can provide it for a group of five employees. Yeah. So that's why I think it has grown as quickly as has, has had. On, on top of that, I think it's been wonderful for us because our staff uh, has been with us for many, many years. We don't have turnover. Uh, I, I working uh, the other day and saw that uh, one of our payroll managers uh, had been with us for 18 years. And that's the area where we have the, the most turnover. And then I started thinking about all of our different payroll managers. And most of them have been there 12, 13, 14, 15 years. We have some newer ones as well. Our HR department, uh, Tiffany Kahn has been with us 20 years, Mark, uh, 22. Her assistant's been with us uh, 20 years. Uh, Chad Knowles, one of the guys in our HR department, the Utah State graduate, uh, been with us for 15 years. I think that's part of the reason is that then our folks who are our clients can reach out and they can touch someone who they know. Yeah. Can I just uh, add uh, credibility to what you're saying? Not that you need any additional credibility, but I ran a small business for 25 years. And I can tell you that um, my partners and I, uh, all ex-Harvard Business School professors, uh, did not understand our way around the tax code, mm -hmm. did not understand our way around the labor department's uh, issues, did not understand our, so our way around all sorts of the back office uh, issues. And to have someone like Resource Management Inc. who could take that with integrity, you mentioned fiduciary responsibility, yeah. take it with integrity, make sure that we were absolutely clean as a whistle so that we could spend our time focused on what we did know about yeah. is a tremendous advantage to a small entrepreneurial company. I absolutely know what you're talking about. It's really amazing. I, again, looking at, at the companies that have been with us, we have companies that have been with us 28 years. Sure. Uh, generally, I, it, it's really funny because I've, I've stayed involved in the sales part of it because I think it's a good way uh, for uh, a CEO to keep his fingers on the pulse of the business. Uh, and it's as, as I talk with these guys uh, and they finally come on, I'll tell them now, you know, you're never going to look back. Uh, you're probably going to be with us until you sell the business. And very often that's exactly what has happened. Right. As I look back over all of the companies that have been with us for uh, many, many years, uh, I've seen them come and grow and I've seen their children grow up. I've seen them sell their businesses and they've stayed with us. Because why would you want to do all of this other stuff? Exactly. I mean, it's great. We love to do it. Well, that's and your core competence. Yeah. And you're excellent at it. And we're, I think we're about as good as they get. And we're a smaller boutique firm. There are companies who have grown to 300, uh, 350,000 employees, but you can't quite call them high touch. So this is the perfect venue for an entrepreneurial person. Is there a limit to how uh, much R RMI can grow? Uh, I, I think we're only limited uh, by what our overall vision is. And, and I think as a company, at least and to, this, uh, to this point, we have always, we, we never thought that bigger was better. We always thought that high touch, high service and good profitability was the most important. And think about it. Uh, we're a co-employer with thousands of employees all coming from a different place. And think about the legal risks there. Uh, think about if we made certain mistakes. Uh, we have a full-time general counsel with us. Uh, if he gives the wrong advice, uh, because again, we're interacting with all of these people, uh, the risk is so high that Don and I together thought, you know, what we want to do is we want to limit our growth to 
the best of the best companies out there. We're going to make sure that we're highly profitable. We're going to make sure that we deliver high touch service. And many of these larger companies can't even spell service, yeah. let alone uh, provide it. it. It's interesting. I'll tell you a quick little story about Please. that. Um, we were uh, interviewing or being interviewed by uh, ADP, mm -hmm. Total Source, which is their PEO. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of fun because we were sitting there and we were talking about profitability and all the different kinds of things that AT ADP does. And they're, you know, they're the 10,000 pound gorilla. They're in New Jersey, I think, aren't they? Uh, they are. And of course, ADP Total Source is their PEO side. Okay. And then ADP... Uh, that just does payroll is another division. But uh, our, our comment to them was, uh, and I, I said this to, to the president, I said, you know, if you guys could get down to the high touch part of your business, you would be incredibly more profitable. Uh, and they at the time were looking at maybe purchase, purchase uh, making a purchase offer to us and, we were going, I, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, because again, that's so far out of what our wheelhouse is. Very different culture. It's a very different culture. And our clients are used to being handled properly. Yeah. Not just going online. And, and I know that many of us, especially in the younger uh, crowd, uh, haven't touched a pencil uh, since you were in kindergarten. But quite frankly, and we have all the online things, uh, and I think that's important. But on the other hand, too, when you want to talk to somebody because you've got a real difficult situation with an employee in your organization, you want to be able to talk to a real person. Sure, absolutely. Uh, I would imagine since you were a lot on the sales side of the business that uh, in the 90s, you must have done a fair amount of traveling. <laughs> we did. Um, during that period of time is when we started the, our office in Seattle. Uh, and so uh, I was up in Seattle probably uh, at least twice a month. Uh, at the same time, we'd started the office in St. George. I was down there, had an old Cadillac. I put uh, 120,000 miles on it and then turned it over to Brandon, who's here with us today when he was in high school. And... Uh, and so a lot of traveling, starting a branch office, not an easy thing to do. Those relationships, though, that you've established over the years probably yeah. uh, give you a great ability to continue to be high touch, even in the midst of COVID. Yeah, and, and that's what's really interesting is that we have been able to be high touch. Mm -hmm. I, I'm working with a client right now. It's, it's really kind of fun uh, because, uh, again, I, I'm a guy that is very much a high touch sort of guy, and I would come up and give a guy a hug and and uh, had to be careful with that uh, as we moved on down the road uh, when it came to <laughs> sexual harassment. But uh, it's just so fun to bring these people in. I've got, uh, I've got this uh, company, the owner of a company and his uh, uh, right-hand assistant coming into the company. We bring them in and set them in the boardroom. And I bring in all of our directors. And they have a chance to meet our directors, to ask questions, to talk about what we do and how we do it. And I just found that that's just such a great way to do business because it makes people understand what our corporate culture is, yeah. which is uh, that of caring, understanding. We're there for you when the chips are down. And believe me, there are uh, stories. I could write books about the, the crazy things that we have got calls on with employers. I'm not a bit surprised to hear that. Let me ask you a little bit about uh, your relationship as a partner with your wife and life partner, Don, and how the two of you have worked together in business. We've got a number of, of uh, women uh, students here in our audience today. I'm sure they'd be interested in knowing how that worked. No, uh, Don and I have two totally different disciplines. She is very much a numbers person, an accountant um, by, by education and trade. Uh, I'm more of a feely, touchy sort of person. And so what we did within our company is that she was over all of those areas, uh, finance and accounting and payroll and 
those areas which required those technical skills. So that's what she is so amazingly good at. And then uh, I was uh, more involved in human resources uh, in uh, the uh, sales and sales areas of our company. It's, it's interesting that you asked that. Uh, you know, in my early years, I served in LDS mission and then I was under a fellow by the mission president by the name of uh, Dr. Don C. Wood. And uh, when we uh, went to go into the mission field, he said, you, you're gonna bring your standard works, but you're also gonna bring a, a book that's called Think and Grow Rich. Napoleon by Hill. Napoleon Hill. And I'm going, whoa, you know, that, that sounds a little bit uh, interesting. But uh, in, in this particular book, it is probably one of the most influential business books that I've read. This was written in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that book, there is an area that, uh, uh, that I found really interesting. Uh, and it's one of the principles that he put down and it was called enthusiastic support. What is that? I'm going to just read this real quickly. It's, it's of great significance that behind practically every great leader has been the supportive love and inspiration of a spouse. When things get tough, and you can count on it, that they will get tough. You may be deserted by some you thought were friends, but if you've got the good woman or man supporting you, you will never be alone. He or she will be willing to start over again. And when, <laughs> when Don married me, I had been in real estate development, had, uh, it was a 1986 tax laws changed the whole world for us. And so on all the real estate uh, basically ended up uh, owned by the FDIC. The Tax Simplification Act That's, of 1986. Yeah. And uh, all of a sudden, all of us that were in real estate uh, kind of bombed. Mm -hmm. And I, I used to tell people uh, when they would ask Don or ask us how we met, I said, well, I, I, I probably would have been out at Pioneer Park with a little cup and pencils in it because uh, this is the kind of a woman that she was. She didn't care about money, didn't care about those things. She just cared about marrying a special person. And I can tell you that as we went through our ups and downs at resource management and the company before that, she was the one that was four square stalwart behind me during those times when I wanted to just lay down and die. And uh, that is probably one of the most important thing along with who you surround yourself wherever you are. Can I just uh, interrupt to say, Don, this award is for you too. So thank you very much. I don't know if you know Gary Crittenden or not, but Gary uh, is a good friend of mine. And uh, I'll just uh, give you a little uh, note on, on, on Gary. Gary uh, grew up in Ogden, uh, went to Harvard Business School, started working uh, right out of Harvard Business School with Bain and Company, uh, uh, was uh, ultimately a partner there, then went into private equity, uh, did a couple of very successful deals, became a CFO of Monsanto, then became a CFO of American Express, then became the CFO of Citicorp. Wow. Uh, and uh, finally came back uh, to, to Utah uh, and uh, ran Huntsman Gig uh, capital, global capital for a while. And he's now, um, uh, I believe he's a general, uh, general authority of the church. Um, but Gary came here and spoke to our, uh, uh, finance club and he was asked the question, you know, what, what do you consider the most important, uh, uh, driver of your success? And he said, just like you did marry the right person. That was number one. Marry the right person. Uh, so very important. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's a person that uh, is either going to be there for you or not. Yeah. Will make the difference in your life. And then again, make sure you surround yourself in your company. If you're entrepreneurial, if you're going to start your company, make sure you bring in 
the best of the best. And I don't necessarily mean just educationally. Uh, get to know who the person is in their heart. Uh, if you have the right people surrounding you, you'll never, you'll never want. It reminds me, I taught military history also yeah. while I was at BYU. I'd always been kind of interested in it. And I remember uh, uh, President Eisenhower, who was, of course, a general of the Army, uh, just so amazing during World War II and the reason that we were able to prevail uh, on the, that front. Uh, people interviewed him and said, uh, what's the most important thing to you? And he says, I always surrounded myself with people who were better than myself. And I always listened to them. And I think that's another thing, is that you surround yourself with the right people, and then you listen to them. And you maintain humility. Because if you don't have the humility enough to be able to listen, you're not going to be successful. Um, it sounds straightforward, and yet many people don't do that. Uh, and, and that's kind of sad, isn't it? Yeah. Where do you think you uh, learned this lesson first? How did you get to this place? Uh, besides picking beans? Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I used to go down in the summertime when I'd come up here and spend the summers. I used to go down to the uh, tabernacle and get on that bus, too. Yeah. But you couldn't cluster pick those beans, either. No, you couldn't. You had to pick them one at a time. And, and put, put them in, in that bucket. sack and dry, bucket, put drag it, sack. it down to the end of the row, right? Oh, I, I tell you, we, we're our old guys. Aren't we? <laughs> I don't think they do that anymore in Cache Valley. Uh, probably not, and, I, and it probably has to do with child labor law. <laughs> you know, I, I think I think I started when I was eight years old. I doubt very much you're going to see an eight-year-old uh, uh, down at a bus with his little bucket and his little lunch going out into the bean fields picking beans. But honestly, that was probably one of the best experiences of my life. Sure. I think the other thing that happens uh, in your lifetime is that uh, failure happens. And every, anytime you get to the point where you think you're really quite special, it seems like something happens yeah. to knock you down. And uh, that, I think, uh, it, it, it's helpful. I think there are other things that keep you grounded. Uh, Don uh, and I were listening to a, a song some time ago, and she reminds me of it uh, sometimes when we get somebody in front of us that's really slow, and they must be old, right? <laughs> and she said, you know, you got to have humility. And so she said, you need to, you need to read uh, or, or understand what the lyrics are with Tim McGraw's lyrics on humble and kind. And there is a, a couple of verses in there that I had to read. It's, sure, please do. In these verses, again, it's Tim McGraw's lyrics, and it's, uh, hold the door, say please, say thank you, don't steal, don't cheat, and don't lie. I know you got mountains to climb, but always stay humble and kind. When the dreams you're dreaming come to you, when the work you put in is realized, let yourself feel the pride, but always stay humble and kind. And then the last verse, don't take for granted the love this life gives you. When you get where you're going, don't forget to turn back around and help the next one in line. Always stay humble and kind. Yeah, that's great words. Great words of wisdom. Listen, I've got a list of other uh, lessons in life from you. The, you can you put these together at our request about five years ago. Oh yeah. And I'd like to take a take us through those rather quickly if we could. Okay. Some of you you've already touched on, so I'll skip over those. Uh, but the first one was: no one in this world is entitled to a free ride. Tell us about that. Well, again, I, I think that kind of goes back to growing up with. A father who's a CPA, uh, and uh, your dad worked here. At Utah he, he worked State. here at Utah State for 37 years, uh, and uh, there there was never a free ride in our home. I, and I, I think the the point that I made in I think it was in the article. I tell this st uh, story often. I think Don's probably worn right out on this one, but uh, my folks wanted to give me a, a bicycle. Uh, I wanted a bicycle when I was before eight, but you know, about eight was when 
they were going to go ahead and give me my sister's bike. And, and I said, there is no way. <laughs> I am going to ride my sister's bike around this town. Girl bike. It was a girl's bike, you know, and it, that just wasn't good. So uh, what I did is got my little bucket, went down, started picking beans. I, for the very first, they used to pay us in dollar bills. At the end of every day, you go down to the end of the bean road and they'd hand that to you. And uh, they'd pay you. And I, that very first time I got paid, I came back and I went down to, uh, I think it was called Grant's bike. We had Al's bike and Grant's bike. Al's is still around. Grant's, I don't believe is. But I went down there and I found the most incredible looking Schwinn bike. And I said, this is the one I want. And I, you guys probably don't know much about layaways, but back then you could lay something away. And I think I put $3 down on that bicycle. <laughs> and every week I would go and put more down on that bike. And quite frankly- That was a lot of beans. That was a lot of beans. <laughs> and uh, so from that point on, I think I just grew up with that kind of mentality. Yeah. Uh, I always wanted a boat. When I was uh, 15 and a half, we could drive here in Utah in that time. And I told my dad, I said, I want a boat. boat. I said, what would you do at the boat? And I said, I'd go water skiing. <laughs> and so he didn't want to buy a boat. And so about six months later, I bought a boat and drove, drove it home. And he just about had a coronary arrest. <laughs> and he asked me, what are you going to do with that? I said, I'm going to store it here and then we're going to go with water skiing. So that you had earned, you had earned it. Earned every penny because I worked in that service station. Yeah. At 14, I started doing the books at the service station. Yeah. And then washing cars and all the rest. And, and your dad honored your decision? He did. Yeah. yeah. He was very supportive. Yeah. Okay. Number two, success comes only through hard, a smart decision making, hard work, and dedication. And I think a lot of people maybe have a, a misconception that. And we hear this often, you guys are really lucky. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, I think people don't realize yeah. the 16, 17 hours a day, the sleepless nights, everything that goes in to building a company. Um, it, it's it's gut-wrenching many times, but the rewards are amazing. Yeah. And decision making there's another question on here in here that was about decision making and that and another thing that came from uh the uh, napoleon hill book and that is when you make a decision look at all the facts but then make the decision don't sit and just angst over it make the decision go forward and, and move do on. what has yeah. to be done. And, and, and I, I found, and maybe I, I'm assuming you did as well and, and, and have done in your business as well, that there may not be a perfect decision, yeah. but uh, execution can make a, a good decision, a great decision. It's very true. And in fact, if you don't buy into your decision and if the people who you work with don't buy into your decision yeah. and you don't have the determination to make sure that it happens, it will not happen. On your point about hard work and dedication, I'm reminded of the quote by Coach Adolph Rupp, who was the coach of Kentucky's basketball team for many, many years, and they kept winning national championships with talent that uh, some of his competitors didn't think was as good as their talent. And so he would be asked over and over again, how on earth have you done this? And his answer was, well, I can tell you one thing. If you see a person on top of a mountain, they didn't fall there. Uh, so hard work, dedication, smart decision making. Uh, we've talked about the decision one, and you've touched on this one, but I want to I ask you to go a little more deeply into it. Failure will happen. Be strong enough to work through it. You know, um, that, that is, is so true. I had, you know, multiple stories I could tell about that, but uh, uh, I, I don't think I've ever been quite so devastated as working in real estate as hard as we had worked to build up a fairly successful company. And then with the stroke of the pen, uh, all of a sudden uh, we had about at that time, 24, $25 million in properties, some of which were under contract to uh, uh, people to buy and uh, everybody walked mm -hmm. and it left sitting on 24, million dollars worth of properties 
that the value had dropped by 30%. And uh, I, I think though- So you were underwater on the- Everything was mortgage. underwater. And the banks then were coming to us and saying, okay, uh, your, your properties aren't worth as much. And so you need to put another $5 million into the project. And there was none. So I think it's those kinds of times when you have to learn how to uh, look at failure and say, okay, what I'm gonna learn from this. Did that wipe you out? I, it did completely. Yeah. I went from, I went down to less than zero. Yeah. And it, it just wiped me completely out. Uh, the one decision that came out of it was pretty interesting is, and, and that was, uh, I decided I, the next business that I got into, I was going to be an entrepreneur no matter what. The next business that I was going to get into was going to be a business with reoccurring income. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and that's what resource management is. It has worked out very well. Yeah. Uh, we touched on the one about surround yourself with people as good or better than you, but let's talk about the next one. A good leader provides authority equal to the responsibility assigned. You know, that's a, that's an interesting question. And, and it, it, I'll tell you, it takes a lot of discipline for somebody running a particular department or division. You'll, you'll all find yourself in that position where you have people working for you. Uh, and you've got to get the job done because the folks upstairs want to have that job taken care of and done perfectly. And you have a decision to make. Are you going to give uh, certain responsibilities out to other people because generally you can't do it all yourself? Uh, or are you going to do it all yourself? Sometimes the easy thing or the non-disciplined thing to do is to do it all yourself. What are you doing to the people who are working with you? and for you. They're not learning. They're not growing. They're not progressing. But on top of that, if you're going to give them a job to do, give them commensurate authority to be able to do that job. The principal, actually, I spent a summer at West Point in a leadership training program. A lot of people don't think of the military as a, this great organization that you know points the needles down and allows people to learn and grow and progress, but quite frankly, it is. Yeah, and Great that leaders. really is an important concept. Yeah, and that's one that's particularly important in the military. I, I uh, remember uh, coming across that uh, principle at Harvard Business School mm -hmm. uh, in a conversation with the then dean of the Harvard Business School. This goes back to the uh, early 1980s. Uh, and there was an issue having to do with a, a, a donor who had been uh, a very good supporter of the Harvard Business School, but their son or daughter, I can't remember which one it was, didn't get in. And it was a decision that the director of admissions made. And uh, I, uh, I remember the conversation with the dean and I said, you know, were you ever tempted to change that decision to overrule the director of admissions? And he said, absolutely not. Because if I had done that, then I was going to be end up being the director of admissions. And I don't have time to be both the director of admissions and the dean. Yeah. And I've, I've remembered that lesson my whole life since then. You've got to be willing to stand behind the decisions that you delegate responsibility to, even and, if they may not be the decision you might have made yourself. Yeah, you, you really, I think as a leader, you have a responsibility to help the people that you're working with. Yeah to learn, to grow, to progress. The only way they can do that sometimes is make a mistake and you almost have to allow them to do that as long as it's not critical. Yeah. Or you're there and you're watching and you're saying, okay, let's nudge them a little bit this way, but allow them to make those decisions. It has to be a decision that's consistent with your values. Absolutely. And, you know, it has to be a decision where, um, you know, you're not, uh, you're not violating any uh, key principles uh, and hopefully one that they will, will learn from. Here, here at the Huntsman School, we, we say, any decision made leaning in the direction of student success is a forgivable mistake if it is a mistake, but any mistake made leaning in some other direction may or may not be forgivable. Yeah. So you've got to be very clear about that. Okay, here's another one. Uh, love what you do or get out of it and find something you do love. 
And that one I, I believe very strongly in as well. Uh, I think very often what will happen is you'll end up uh, working in some kind of a position where it just is awful to go to work. What do you think, Jordan? Jordan uh, worked for an ad firm in New York City, loved working for the ad firm, and then left there and went to work for Yelp. And I'm not knocking Yelp, but I'm telling you that uh, that that wasn't fun, was it? And uh, he couldn't get out of there fast enough. And he came back here and they built a very successful company. Um, you have got to have love and enthusiasm for what you do. Um, if you don't, you're not going to be good at it yet. And I, I think it's just as simple as that. You, you need to, when you wake up, you need to jump out of bed and say, this is, I am so excited for what's going to happen today. Now, I'm not telling you that everything that you're going to do is going to be that way. But if you feel that way about your company or your organization, you're going to be successful at it. So I got to ask you, as you were chatting with Jordan about his experience at Yelp, how did you, you know, counsel with him? Hey, he actually made the decision himself. But, uh, you know, my, my first uh, inclination was, well, just stick with it for a little while. Part of that in the back of my mind, and I have really shared this with Jordan, is I wanted him to have an experience that uh, was maybe a little bit difficult so that there would be an appreciation for what came next. Yeah. So is there? <laughs> <laughs> you, can, uh, you can enjoy the sweet because you knew the bitter, huh? <laughs> okay. But, uh, but uh, again, he ended up uh, making that decision himself, coming home. They had started, and it was actually at BYU, this company that he now yeah. owns, uh, he and a partner. And... Uh, decided to come back and, and make that work. And they hit their first million dollars in sales in August. And uh, they think that they're gonna finish the year just south of two and a half, maybe three million. Oh, congratulations, that's wonderful. A um, Couple of more uh, on this list, and then we'll open it up for some, uh, some questions. Don't focus on money, focus on being the best at what you do and then the rest will follow. You know, and I think that's a common problem that a lot of people have, and that is, boy, I want to, I want to, I want to go to New York City, and I want to work for an investment banker, and I'm going to make just loads of money. They're really, the wrong decision to make. Yeah. Um, first of all, you have to be in an area where you have a great passion for it, mm -hmm. and then you have to love it, and you have to study it, and you have to know as much as you possibly can. Again, this was one of the principles that was in Napoleon Hill's book. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's a, a principle that was called uh, specialized knowledge. Mm -hmm. And uh, you need to know that business inside and out. You need to love it. And if you don't, you need to bail and go get into something that you do love. Yeah. Yeah. Because you'll never be successful at it. And if you're successful at it and you're doing working hard at it, the success will come. It will follow you. Uh, it's not all certainly about the money. My, my generation was probably more about that than, than I think our current generation, which uh, has a tendency to care more about the world. And, uh, and, and I think I've seen here at Huntsman, uh, the projects that you do, the things that you're doing in Africa, et cetera. Yeah. What great things. Yeah. The focus on purpose uh, and yep. passion. Um, here's another one. Demand loyalty, but remember that it is a two-way street. Yeah, and I think that's, uh, again, going back to the, the military background, you surrounded yourself with uh, all kinds of folks, and, and there it got real serious because loyalty was probably one of the most important things there. You know that this guy had your back and you're out in a war zone, and if he turned and ran, you were dead. Uh, I, I don't think it's much different in business. Mm -hmm. I think you have to demand loyalty, but you have to remember, which we also learn in the military, that is a two-way street. You better be loyal to the men and women around you 
and loyal almost to a fault. If you're demanding loyalty, always remember it's a two-way street. This next one follows very well from that. Remember, it's not all about you. Pretty easy to get to that point if you have a certain amount of success in whatever you're doing. You start to think that you're pretty special. Yeah. That's uh, those times that Don reminds me. Maybe you better turn on humble and kind. <laughs> That's again, when if you have good people around you, they'll remind you. Yeah. It's nice to have those kind of phrases. It, to, it is. <laughs> it <laughs> is. Be very, very much so. Okay. Um, you, you say, uh, if you love what you do, others around you will catch the vision yeah. and the associated enthusiasm. And you know, how true is that? Have you ever, uh, I know we don't have classes like here at Utah State, but have you ever been in a class where uh, the professor speaks in just total monotone and you're going, I've got to go through a whole semester of this? <laughs> uh, the bottom line is, and I remember, uh, I can't remember his first name, it's Professor Israelson was back in our era. Yeah. He taught economics. And I can remember just being excited to go to his class because every day in his class, we would have Wall Street Journal. Sure. And he turned to this and he says, okay, we're going to talk about some specific part of economics. And then we'd read about what had happened the other day in uh, in business and it made it live yeah. and he was excited about it sure i had a, a mission president also his name was ivan j barrett and uh, he used to teach the book of mormon right. classes down at byu you yeah. may have had a class i, I know who then. he is i can remember that the joke about him and it was true because i saw him do it when i was in the mission field he would jump up on a table and talk about the Gadiant robbers. <laughs> uh, and, you know, it, it's that kind of enthusiasm that you've got to have, because if you do have that, everybody in your organization is going to catch it. They're going to love it. And you've got to be reasonable about it. You're probably not going to jump up on a chair or a table or on the boardroom table and start doing a little jig. I actually did have a teacher uh, growing up in Southern California, Pasadena, uh, John Muir High School, I had a black teacher who was the, uh, uh, the biology teacher. He happened also to be a Baptist minister and, uh, uh, and a very good athlete. And he actually, from a standing stop, jumped up onto the lab table uh, <laughs> as a way to kind of get us interested in biology, if you can believe it. Yeah, he did uh, a great vertical jump. A great vertical <laughs> jump. His name was Dr. Jackson. And I'll never forget that guy because of his enthusiasm. Great man. Final, final uh, 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 message that you've got here. Leave fear at the back door. It doesn't serve you well. You know and how true that is. Um, I think that if you get up every day and you're fearful uh, of what's going to happen to you, that has a tendency to begin to inculcate itself into your mind. Again, going back to think and grow rich. Uh, if you approach life and you're dealing with fear all of the time, it can be a bit of a motivator because you don't want to fail, but keep it in check. Manage it. Make sure that you know that there is always a way out. Uh, it kind of reminds me, again, uh, Dawn is, is an amazing person because uh, she's got a, a mind like a trap and she, she should have been uh, in computer science because everything is a system. And she'll, you know, we're handling so much money that has to be accounted for in so many different areas. Uh, and she'll sit at her desk and try to think, how am I going to handle this and make sure that we balance the penny and we're a fully audited, uh, reviewed company every quarter. And uh, she'll come home and she'll go to bed at night and she'll toss and turn. But 
that idea is in her mind. Mm. Your mind is always working and she will wake up. How many times has this happened? <laughs> With the answer to the problem. Uh, and it's, there, there's a little bit of fear in that, that I'm not going to get it quite right. But then she thinks it through and goes to sleep. And the next day, the she comes there. back and she's worked out formulas yeah. I couldn't touch with a thousand foot pole. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you have to leave fear at the door. Exactly. You have to recognize what it is, what it's good for. You utilize it to motivate yourself, but you do not let it drive you into the ground. As they said about hanging, whatever else may be said about it, at least it focuses the mind. <laughs> How true that is. Let's open it up. We have a few minutes for some questions. Let's see if the audience has uh, some questions. Yes, sir. Yeah. I'm going to repeat the question because we have people who are watching uh, via Zoom. We've got the uh, cameras here. Uh, the question is here in, uh, during COVID, how have you helped small companies become agile? That's a, you know, that's a great question. And it's, it's been something that we, I think, have solidified in the minds of all of our clients. What a great value. Uh, outsourcing to a professional employer organization like resource management is. Um, as the government came out with the uh, PPP, most people said, well, okay, we understand what that is. We, we can get some funds for the, from the government to keep our business up and running and, and we can be able to pay our employees and then if we follow certain rules and regulations, that that's going to be forgiven. I can tell you that there's probably not a client of ours that understood all the innuendos and the ins and outs of that. Uh, we already had relationships with many banks. And so we reached out not only by giving all of the information to our client companies, but then we had... Uh, lines where they could call in and talk to us. And then we reached out to our bankers and we hooked up our, our uh, clients with the bankers because very often they would, we would touch base with them because we we're on the phone with them all of the time, just making sure, of you, are you, is your PPP loan in place? Do you need help? How can we help you further? And very often what we would do, we got them to Zion's Bank. And Zion's Bank, one thing about them is that they're a local bank here and they got on this, they were working 24 hours a day and they got that money out to, to all of our people. So the bottom line is, is all of a sudden, uh, it wasn't just payroll and making sure that they could have, had health insurance and a 401k and all of that. We literally helped them to stay in business. I think out of the thousands of employees that we had, we went down about 450 employees. That was it through the entire pandemic, all of our clients part of which was because we were able to reach out and to assist them in getting to where they needed to be. Many of them would call us and they would say, okay, we want to keep our employees here. And so how can we do that? Are there ways that legally we can now sort of cut back on wages so we can keep everybody here? So we came up with strategies to help them go through all of that. So again, a great question. We became, I think, just a total, complete imperative uh, for our clients. Yeah. Another question? Yes. Okay, the question uh, is, uh, you, you lead a company that has a low turnover rate among employees, but what advice do you give to a company that has a high turnover rate? Come with resource management. We'll try to keep that, get that rate down. Because what happens is when you're co-employed, uh, our unemployment rate is the rate. 
And so you come in with us and what we'll try to do is to set up programs with these companies to help the employees to start looking at the company as a career. Now, not all co companies that way. If you're running one of the little soda shops, you're gonna naturally have people who are there and they're gonna be part-time. But those who are not part-time, we will make sure that they have benefits and they have other kinds of things. Even if you can't afford to participate in the health benefits, we then throw out, uh, we have a dental plan. We have a vision care plan that you can get in for $10 and almost everybody can afford that. And so they start seeing those kinds of things. And so they begin to stay with you longer. Uh, we also manage uh, unemployment very carefully. Uh, we do uh, the hiring, we do the terminations. We do a lot of those kinds of things, hand in hand with our, our client companies. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think a lot of that has to do with the corporate culture, but also understanding that there are some businesses where you're going to have turnover and it's gonna be seasonal. So we, you just have to deal with how to strategically deal with that in a way that keeps you whole because your unemployment costs are gonna go out of this world. Turnover comes with a real price, a real cost associated oh. with it. So you can bring that down. Retraining. Yeah, you can uh, save a lot of money. Yes. The question is, the, the question is, uh, you've mentioned how important finding a vocation is that you're passionate about, but when you're in school, how do you find that? How do you, how do you discover that with limited experience? You know, I, I think that's probably one of the most difficult things. Um, we've all had to deal with that. Very few of us uh, come out of the pod and say, oh, you know, I want to be an HR professional, or I want to be an accountant, or I want to be a doctor. Um, I think what you have to do as you're in this great university experience is to become involved in everything you can become involved here, whether it's in the clubs, whether it, and, and don't stay just focused on one area. Uh, I, I was head of the entertainment bureau here at USU. Uh, I planned, I think when I came back in my sophomore year, I planned probably three fourths of all the dances here. My senior year, I was in the leadership committee and planned all of the, uh, all the getaways when we had uh, uh, leadership training for uh, all of the Greeks and, and all of the heads of the areas. And then I mentioned it was also uh, it, uh, dealing with all the, the talent in the school. What I found is that the more you did in all kinds of areas, then you start to hone in and find things. What do I like? I like in a relationship with people. Uh, and the more you, you do here in your university experience, you will eventually find what you really love. In my case, I mean, uh, it was the Vietnam War. I was in the ROTC. It was gonna come out as a young lieutenant. So I knew that that's what I was gonna be doing. Uh, and so it gave me a lot of other experiences, which were just incredible experiences. So I'm not telling you going to the military, but, but I can tell you that that was a great experience for me. Experiential learning is what you're Experiential talking about. Experiential learning, there's nothing that compares to it. I think we've ended on a very high with that last comment, uh, Kurt. And so we've come to that point where we want to officially recognize you Thank as you. our distinguished executive alumnus of the year. And so I'm going to ask my assistant, Julia, to help me uh, do this. If you'll stand up with me, Kurt. Okay. Uh, Julia will hold, hold the, uh, the award for us for just a moment uh, while I read the citation. Okay. Kurt Larson is a true blue Aggie who graduated in 1969 with his bachelor's degree in personnel and industrial relations from Utah State University's College of Business, now the John M. Huntsman School of Business. He joined the ROTC while at Utah State and was later commissioned as a lieutenant in the U.S. Army. Over his 10 years of service in the military, he completed two tours of duty in Germany and one in, in Vietnam, earning a Bronze Star for his contributions. He served as a company commander, platoon leader, and major staff officer. The military sent him to Ball State University, where he earned his master's in public administration. He was then assigned to teach leadership in military history at Brigham Young University's 
ROTC program. In addition to his military service, Kurt has served for two years as a, a missionary for his church, where he continues to volunteer on a regular basis. Early on in his professional life, Kurt owned a real estate development company, travel agency, and small manufacturing company where he learned firsthand the challenges small business owners face. Consequently, in 1992, he founded Resource Management Inc. along with his wife, Dawn, which handles a broad range of administrative human resource functions for businesses, allowing the owners to focus their efforts on other aspects of business such as production and growth. Under Kurt's leadership, resource management has grown to represent more than 14,000 employees in 50 states with gross revenues of $640 million per year. Kurt Larson, for your entrepreneurial spirit, ethical leadership, and your enduring loyalty to Utah State University, we are proud and honored to recognize you with the 2020 John M. Huntsman School of Business Distinguished Executive Alumnus Award. Congratulations. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, thank you so very much. Uh, I'm, I'm honored. And uh, who would have thought a mediocre student from USU would be this successful in, in life and it have been a good ride. But again, it's because I surrounded myself with wonderful people who have helped to get us to where we are. Thank you for being such a great example of what we aspire to here at Utah State University. Congratulations. Oh, thank you.